Your brain needs support, and new Ollie Brainy Chews are a delightful way to take care of your cognitive health. Made with scientifically backed ingredients like Thai ginger, L theanine, and caffeine, Brainy Chews support healthy brain function and help you find your focus, stay chill, or get energized. Be kind to your mind and get these nootropic chews at ollie.com. That's O-L-L-Y.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hi, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my behind-the-scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books and I do too. We couldn't find a comprehensive list of titles all in one place, so we made one ourselves, and now we're sharing it with you. The link to buy it is in my show notes. Today I am chatting with Eileen Garvin about Crow Talk. The second that I saw the cover and then read the synopsis of this one, I knew I had to read it, and it definitely did not disappoint. While I read it in late 2023, it was my first book to read that was published in 2024, and it let me know that it was going to be a wonderful year for books. Eileen is the national bestselling author of The Music of Bees. Born and raised in eastern Washington, she and her husband share their home in Hood River, Oregon, with a fearless calico cat, a passionate Baja mutt, four chickens, and about 120,000 honeybees. I hope you enjoy our conversation. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Welcome, Eileen. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. Your book is the first 2024 read that I read. I read it back in either October or November of 2023, and I loved it. I felt like it made me know that 2024 was going to be a banner year for books. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thanks for including me. Absolutely. Well, what I like to do is have an author start out by giving me a synopsis of the book for those that haven't read it yet. So will you do that? I'd be happy to. Um, I would say that at its heart, Crow Talk is really about finding your voice. And each one of my three main characters has lost the ability to tell their story, sometimes figuratively, sometimes literally, and in some cases, both. For one of them, it's her scientific research that's been taken away. For another, it's her ability to compose music. And for the third, it's his actual speaking voice. Without giving anything away, I'll tell you a little bit about these three, these three characters. Frankie O'Neill, who readers meet first, is a young ornithology graduate student, and she's struggling to complete her thesis. Anne Ryan is an Irish composer and instructor on leave from school, and she has sort of lost the ability to make her music. And the third character is Anne's young son, five-year-old Aiden, who's this bright little boy who has suddenly stopped speaking about a year and a half before the book opens, and nobody knows why. So the, the three of them are, they, they don't know each other. Frankie and um, Anne and Aiden don't know, Anne and Aiden don't know Frankie, but their lives kind of intersect after this chance encounter with a, an injured baby crow. So that's really what, but it, it's it, at its heart, as I said, it's, it's really about trying to find, right, rediscover voice. How did you come up with the idea for this one or ideas really? Well, it started with the setting, quite frankly. It, it was, I, I, I set the story in a in a remote alpine lake that I that I made up but it was inspired by beautiful places that I have loved and so when I decided to write crow talk I was thinking about the healing power of nature in my own life and the way that um happened was uh it was May of 2020 and uh, a memorable month for all of us and I just turned in 
the final revision of my debut novel to my editor, which had been a wonderful distraction during the early days of the pandemic. And then I had to face reality and it had become apparent by then that we were not going to be sheltering in place for two weeks. And I thought, no problem. I, I live in the Columbia River Gorge, National Scenic Area. And nature is my therapy and I'll be just fine. And for reference, the scenic area is this gorgeous 80-mile swath uh, that that crosses Oregon and Washington and um, is filled with mountains and rivers and trails. And it's just absolutely a beautiful place. So I, I you know, and I obviously love to live here. And I, I thought, okay, this is very comforting to me. And sometimes I think I have kind of a, a fourth grader sense of justice, like, of course, everyone will follow the rules <laughs> and, and stay home. But of course, what happened during this time was that all these folks that were working from home and schooling from home left the cities and came to the Columbia River Gorge. And we didn't have masks, we didn't have vaccines. The state government freaked out and shut everything down. All the Forest Service, uh, national forests, all the state parks, all the county parks. There was this one little trail in my town that everyone was desperately trying to use. And um, I was just longing to be outside in the woods. So I decided to make a break for this family place. My parents bought a, a, a lake cabin when I was two and we still have it. And so I threw a bunch of food in the cooler and I drove across two states and I got there. I got to the house just as this huge storm was breaking over the hill. And I felt so much relief at being alone and outside and under the trees. And so when I sat down to write this book, I was thinking about that. And I thought, what if I took, you know, three hurting people and put them in a beautiful landscape and how might it help them to heal? And I love birds. That's one of the reasons I first picked up the book was the title and then reading the synopsis. How did the bird aspects of the story get woven in? The bird aspect was something that I chose because I've discovered that I am, I am an English major through and through, and I am a, a biology major wannabe. I, I kind of joke, our family's divided in half, humanities majors on one side and scientists on the other, and fiction is the closest I'm ever going to get to science. And so I'm an amateur bird watcher and lover and a listener, really. That's a big part of it that I, I came, became clear to me when I was writing this book. I'm, a, I'm a very much attuned to hearing birds, and I usually recognize their, their voices before I recognize them visually. So I, I began with this idea, okay, I want, to, I want to incorporate an ornithologist in the story as an excuse to play with learning about birds. And originally, I thought I would focus on the sp spotted owl which is such a quintessentially Pacific Northwestern bird and speaks so much to the ethos of, of uh, environmentalism and, and conservationism in, in Pacific Northwest. But spotted owls are <laughs> hard to observe because they are crepuscular or nocturnal, and I am not. And um, so I was thinking, okay, what's a different bird I can focus on? And the more time I spent outside walking around in the woods and in my neighborhood, and when I'd run into the city for the day, I just, I started noticing that crows were everywhere. And they, they are, they charmed me. I know uh, many people don't like them. People seem to either love crows or hate crows. And I just found them so delightful. They were brazen and brave and, and loud and always watching people. You know, they're not, they're not going to be surprised by anything we do. And they won me over. And I'm, I'm sort of a fan of the underdog. So I thought, oh, I'm going to change this from, from the spotted owl to, to the common crow. Well, I love that because I had a view of the crow that you're describing when I first was reading your book. Like, why would she write about crows? But then I learned so much about them and I loved it. And I love that they can recognize people's faces. I was just fascinated with all of that. I, I know, me as well. I, I le I've learned so many interesting things through the research of crows, including this, as you mentioned, the ability to recognize faces, how they take care of their young and their injured family members or flock members. I learned about how they they play. They have this real capacity for play and for mimicry, mimicking, mimicking other birds and even human voices. And in some cases, that that recognition that that we talk about it allows them to recognize enemies, but in other cases, it allows them to recognize allies. And I've read many stories, but also have heard anecdotally from friends and neighbors about crows bringing them gifts, which is, is just delightful. I agree completely. I don't live where I see crows a lot, but I am now a fan of crows after reading your book. And I just thought that they were so wonderful, as you mentioned, bringing gifts, 
taking care of each other, interacting with humans. All of it was just really, truly wonderful. I loved that your book was so engaging, but I also learned all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, one of my favorite things with fiction is to inhabit other worlds so I can learn something. So I, I hope that people will enjoy the, the crow detail. Absolutely. And then the way you begin each chapter with both a title that's related to birding, but also with a quote from a field guide that I saw in your author's note that you created. So I'd love to talk a little bit about creating the field guide versus using one that was out there and how you chose each saying or expression or anecdote from the field guide to start each chapter. That's something I love in other novels. It, when there's an epigraph like that or a poem, it's sort of a clue, I feel, into a theme that will emerge in the chapter. And I got this idea because I've used it before. <laughs> this is my third book. And my, in, the, in the last one, uh, which was all about beekeeping, I, I went to, I like to go to the original source, uh, as you would say. So my, my, my first book was a memoir about growing up with a sibling with autism and trying to handle difficult social situations as part of it. And so I thought, okay, who's the expert on handling social situations? So I went to Emily Post, and I used Emily Post blurbs at the beginning of each chapter. So for the music of bees, I, I thought, okay, who's the source? Who's our oldest source on beekeeping? And there's a wonderful writer and inventor named L.L. Langstroth. So I used those. So I, I just thought, I want to keep up this routine. So I'm going to go back to a source book for, for learning about birds. And so I originally started with a book that we owned as a family called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Birds that's really compared to the kind of thing that we can find these days is just, it's from the 70s. So the pictures are bad and there's, you know, it's just, it's not the kind of thing that, that we have now, but I, I, it, I liked using it as sort of talismanic of my own childhood. However, I, I couldn't get permission to use it because it's been out of print and it was so complicated. I kept trying and they, I kept getting this friendly explanation from a chat bot that they'd gotten my, don't worry, we're passing along your inquiry and it never happened. So kind of at the last minute, I decided with my editor that instead we needed to just make them up um, and make up a source. So that was actually really freeing. And I took the intent that I had to use this other source book that really exists and just played with it instead. And I liked using what feels like a little bit of stilted 1970s uh, scientific language, because that's Frankie's book from when she's a child, using that to, to give a bit of insight into what's coming next in the chapter. Yes, I always love when that happens too. And I like reading it at the front end, reading the chapter, and then going back and reading it again, because I feel like then I realize, okay, this is why she chose it, or he chose this particular passage at the beginning of the chapter. Right. I love that too. And then that's interesting that you said it was freeing. I figured that's why you did it. I didn't even think about getting rights to an older book. I just figured it gave you a lot more leeway in terms of the quotes that you could use if you were making them up yourself. I mean, obviously, they're based on stuff, but you're making them up so you can use them however you want. Right. And, it, and ultimately, they adhered to the spirit of the, my original intention. When I look back at that, I, I had chosen some quotes from the book that I couldn't use. And, I, but I liked making it, I wanted it to be different. I didn't want it to be my voice. I guess that's what, I didn't want it to be the narrator's voice or, or have a resonance of Frankie or Anne or Aiden. And so I pulled back to that kind of sterile 1970s guide, hoping that scientific voice would be another layer that was distinct from the others. Exactly. And you lead me into my next question, which was the format having Frankie and Anne tell their stories, as well as having little fairy tale snippets thrown in. How did you decide to do that? How did I decide to throw in the fairy tales? And to have both Frankie and Anne telling the story, all of it. I, that just really, a multiple point of view stories really appeal to me. I feel that they get us a little closer to the inside of a character's mind. And there, while Frankie, Aiden, and and Anne are all at the same place. June Lake is the setting, and it's rather remote. You know, there's not a lot going on. They can't go to the coffee shop. They can't interact with other people. It's a, it's a very remote spot that's boat access only. And so there's not, there's a closeness there. But I wanted to give the reader a view into the minds of, of different people. So the fairy tale snippets are actually, you'll, I don't think this is spoiling anything, but as the reader goes along, they understand that that's actually Aiden. 
and Aiden has lost the ability to speak or retreated into silence for some reason. And so he's using fairy tales. He's using his source book, which is this book of fairy tales that he has to think about things. And that was probably the most challenging and also entertaining point of view to work on because I love fairy tales. I I'm, I have a huge, I don't have children, but I have a huge collection of children's books. And I went back to my Grimm's fairy tales and Hans Christian Andersen and the like to, to draft this story. And I was so taken with how many stories there were about birds and and in magical and talking animals and people transformed into birds and strangely enough many stories about people usually a young girl or a woman being told that if they just remain silent for 7 years they will free their brother spouse prince or what have you so that was really fun to rediscover and then Aiden is using them to try and explain what's happening inside of his head because he can't He's not speaking out outside of his, of his head. And he's familiar with all these stories. So that's a way for him to try to translate what he knows into what's happening around him. Right. He's, he's kind of, he's carrying the storybook around. You see it referenced to Anne will say, I don't know that Aiden ever brings up his book, but Anne will say, you know, I saw him there. He was sitting at the window bench with his little storybook on his knee. I wonder what he's thinking about. And he's, he's kind of going over these stories and that he's read a million times, which I think we all did when we were kids and they're becoming an avenue for him to try and make sense of what's happening to him. And who inspired Aiden? Did anyone? Aiden was inspired by my sister, Margaret, who I, I mentioned earlier. I grew up in a, in a large family and I'm the youngest of five of us. Margaret was diagnosed with autism in the 70s in a time when mm, people didn't know what autism was or were, or were not greatly familiar with it. And Margaret didn't speak until she was seven. I just put this all together recently, actually. I was talking to my mom about it. So we're three years apart. She was diagnosed the month I was born. She didn't speak till she was seven and I was four. And we were very close because we were the two youngest girls kind of thrown together as, as, as happens in families. And I was kind of her, her companion, her, her, you know, watching out for her. I was kind of like her big little sister. And so consequently, I... She still does not talk very much, and I spend a lot of time reading her moods, trying to understand what she might need without her being able to tell me uh, throughout the course of our lives. And so having a child in the story that is not speaking, it felt very familiar to me and also was a way to sort of distill what I'm always learning from my sister as well about how we communicate without verbal communication between people with animals because we have Aiden interacting with the crow we have we have Frankie interacting with the crow so that it's something that really interests me different ways of communication and that was and so in that way Aiden's character was inspired by my sister Margaret once you mentioned your memoir I figured that but I thought I would just ask to give you the yeah. freedom to answer how you wanted thank you and you create such a strong sense of place. You've highlighted a little bit about June Lake, but let's talk more about it. I love strong sense of place. I mean, that is one of the things I look for in books. And I felt like I was transported there. I loved it. Oh, thank you for saying that. That's, that's my goal. I, too, love a strong sense of place in a book. And I love this place. I love where I live. I, as I mentioned, the, the family cabin was some inspiration for creating June Lake. And Mount Adams, which is supposedly where the story takes place, is one of the Cascade volcanoes, now dormant, that I can see from my house just walking around the neighborhood. I love Mount Adams. I, I climbed it once. I love to cross-country ski up there. I love to go hiking up there. And just living in this place and the Pacific Northwest is so, we're so lucky in that we are surrounded by forests and rivers and and we can get out under the trees. And that makes me feel so calm and it gives me a lot. And, and I really wanted to convey that to readers to, to, to take them to this place and, and see how, how, how it felt for them to get to inhabit that, that location for, for a while, for a story. And the restorative power of nature. You tackle a variety of themes, and that was one of the ones I wanted to highlight, in addition to grief and community and the importance of how we interact with each other. But let's talk a little bit about nature. 
first and how it is restorative and how important it is for people to understand that and to try to get out into nature, at least some, depending on where they live. I think that's something I knew as a child without knowing I was learning it because we had this this family place. And it was it was really a respite for all of us, especially for my sister, because she had just catastrophic meltdowns because she couldn't communicate and it was really hard for her and it was hard for us. And to be out there where there was just loads of quiet, there wasn't there weren't a lot of people around, was very healing for all of us. And I noticed during the pandemic the early days, people walking around my neighborhood, um, neighbors with little kids, with, they had their bird books out. And I thought, oh, this is so great. People are taking the time to slow down and look around and, and see what's right, right here, right in front of you at the park or, or in, in your yard. And I know that I had a lot of conversations during the pandemic about that, about how how comforting it was to be outside. And there's so much science about how our brains respond to the natural world, to to sounds and the sensations of being outside because we are animals, because we belong to the natural world and we become cut off from it. One of my favorite books on this topic is The Nature Fix by Florence Williams. And she looks at various studies around the world looking at how humans respond positively to nature and how it can be healing. Well, and the flip side to that, which I find equally fascinating, is how so many people don't really understand how to be in nature. We're big national park people, so we always are traveling to different national parks, especially the mountains and getting outside. And so my kids from a very young age have learned, okay, leave everything as it is, don't take stuff, you know, stay on the path, treat everything like it should be treated. But when you go and visit these places, you see so many people that have no concept of that and, and don't do it, but also who just race to wherever it is and race back and they're not looking around, they're not paying attention. It's sad. I know. It really is it, that short attention span. And I think there are some places that do a good job trying to educate people about how to behave in a national park or how to behave outdoors. And I'm thinking in particular, our, our my state, the Oregon Department of Tourism has a wonderful organization called Travel Oregon that that etiquette is one of the things that they will they will talk about from time to time. But I think what you're talking about is stems from our short term attention spans from the digital age that we live in. People are always looking at their phones. They're they're waiting for the next entertainment or stimulation from their phone or from the computer, and they don't know how to just be quiet. Why are yoga classes so chock full of people just trying to be quiet for the five minutes of Savasana without making your grocery list or whatever that you have going on in your mind? We, we're just out of touch with just being quiet in our bodies and being outside. And it really is a shame. Our national park system is fantastic. And when I too see people rushing from viewpoint to viewpoint to get the Instagram photo and then jump back in the car and race away, they're really missing the point. The good news is that you can start wherever you are. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, you probably live somewhere that there's a park. And if you just can practice sitting and being quiet and listening to what's going on around you, the benefits are, are pretty immediate. So that I, I have hope that people will rediscover how restorative it is to be outside and how lucky we are to still have so much beauty in the world we live in. I agree. And I'm in the heart of Houston, so there's not a lot of nature around except for parks. But I find even sitting in my backyard where there are birds and butterflies and things like that is so much more relaxing to me as long as it's not dead summer and 100 degrees to sit out there and just enjoy the peace and the quiet and all of it. So yes, I agree with you. You don't have to necessarily go anywhere you can start at home or right. start near your home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, which character was the easiest to write and which was the hardest to write? Okay, which was the easiest and which was the hardest? I think I think Frankie was the easiest to write because of what I said earlier about being a wannabe wildlife biologist <laughs> because I'm an English major with the the heart of a wildlife biologist, but I just don't understand science. So that was, that, because that was so intentional, I knew that I was going to have to do some research to try and act like, like I was a master's in ornithology. And I knew what her quandary was. 
The harder one for me was Aiden because I knew I wasn't going to have him speaking in a traditional way. So how could I show without telling? How could I keep feeding the reader bits and pieces of his story through the stories he was reading and have it still make sense as part of the narrative? I think that was that was a more challenging character for me. That makes sense. And with no spoilers, I just want to say I was very happy the direction that Frankie's story took. As it was starting out, I was wondering, okay, what is Frankie grappling with? And I was just really hoping it wasn't going to be something that is very common. So I was just happy the direction you went with that. I will say that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, will, I won't say any more because I don't want to give anything away either. <laughs> exactly. But this will encourage people to read it. Yeah. Well, what surprised you the most when you were writing Crow Talk? I think what surprised me the most was how much fun I had writing this story in the 90s. And I don't know if you even picked up on that as a reader, but I did this on purpose. Where this came from, I think I said it in 98, if I'm not I'm not mistaken. There are so many revisions that go by. But it was the summer of 2021 before I sat down to write this in earnest. And we were past the original pandemic fatigue. And there was this kind of, um, or rather pandemic stress. And there was this this over overconnected fatigue. I felt like everyone was being pressured to be online and be connected and available all the time. And I wanted to throw my phone across the room half the time. And I don't even have a regular job. So I, I but I saw a lot of suffering around me. People just technology was really putting in the, the thumb screws. So I thought, okay, I wanna I wanna not include smartphones. How do I do that? All right, I'm gonna put it in the 90s. So still that I think I mentioned email a couple of times, but it wasn't this the way it is now. And consequently, that meant that my my characters had to communicate with each other either in person, over the payphone, <laughs> or or through the US mail. And and I, I love that. Uh, I had so much fun because it t- it took more thought to say, oh, well, how how is Frankie gonna solve this problem? Or how how are these two gonna communicate? They can't just send a quick text to try and, you know, clear things up. They had to think about, you know, and, and I should explain, to use the payphone, you had to get in the boat, you had to drive down the lake, and you had to go stand in the parking lot, and it might be raining, and you had to have quarters. So all the, this kind of old-fashioned life that I grew up with, I really enjoyed bringing that into the story, and it, it surprised me how much fun that was to revisit it. And how calmer our lives were. Anytime I read a story that's set during that time period and you have to communicate in the ways you were describing, I think, oh, gosh, it was so much simpler. I mean, some things weren't. Some things are a lot easier now. But some things were so nice because you could cross it off your list. You could hand over whatever portion you were supposed to be doing. And then you could wait a little while till it came back to you. But sometimes that doesn't happen at all. Now I turn it in and then two seconds later, people have already responded to me. I know. I remember. And you'd you leave the office on Friday and then you go in and on Monday morning and check your messages. And, you know, it's just like there were more, there were borders to, to our work in a, in a way that there, there is not now. And if you, your answering machine ran out of tape or, <laughs> or the power went out, whoops, you know, you didn't get that phone call from somebody and it probably was okay. Everything worked out okay. So I, I, I feel nostalgic for those times. I agree. Well, what about your stunning cover? I just think it is so beautiful. Do you love it? I love this cover so much. Yes, I do. And the designer really understood what I was looking for with this this big mountain. So my editor and I first started discussing the idea for the design. I should back up and say I am not a visual person. I know what I like, but I don't know how to explain it. And so I was I was nervous about how to, how to convey what I thought might work. Uh, we decided to start with these, the idea of a vintage travel poster that you might see, you know, visit Mount Hood or ski the Cascades or something like that. And so that feel, I think, really comes across with this big mountain that, that looks very much like Mount Adams in the, in the background and then the lake in front of it and Frankie in the boat approaching Beauty Bay on June Lake. I just love it. I do, too. It's what made me pick up the book initially. Well, that and the title, Crow Talk, because I knew it was about birds. Yeah, right. Right. Who says that we don't judge books by covers? We do it all the time. (laughs) I say that almost every single episode. (laughs) I always judge books by covers. So, yes, I think it's really important. And I think the title is, too. I think the title's great, too. I I did not expect it to necessarily remain. I know you've, you've probably talked with other 
authors about this, you start with a working title and then the editor changes it or the agent or the marketing team. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't, I'm not too attached to, to where that ends up. Uh, those people are smarter than I am, but Crow Talk worked for everybody. And the original research on crow vocalization was done by a scientist named Dwight Chamberlain, and he did his first study in the 1970s. He had speakers and recording equipment mounted on the ski rack of his Subaru, which I just love. And his original study collected t- more than 20 distinct vocalizations of crows from that he identified as everything from alert calls to alarm calls, juvenile begging calls, uh, courtship calls. And I, I just loved that, the conversation. And so Crow Talk really is what Frankie becomes interested in, even though her research is on the spotted owl. And it just felt like it, it worked for, for the story, for the, for the title of the book. I agree completely. Well, Eileen, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you really liked? I've been reading a lot, which is so awesome to have time for. Um, I, and I have to say, I recently did something I never thought I would do, which is that I got an e-reader. I got a Kobo reader. I don't know if you're familiar with the Kobo reader. That's the one that's independent, correct? Yes, the Kobo is independent. So it links to your independent bookstore. So I never thought I'd buy a Kobo reader, but I read a lot. I was traveling. I couldn't carry 50 pounds of books with me. So I bought the Kobo and I've been reading so much more, especially at night. And my husband's thrilled because I'm not keeping him up. So Lately, uh, the last, I'm going to give you three. I tend to read a lot of fiction, but I've read, I've been reading a mix of things. Just finished Solito by Javier Zamora, which is a memoir of his migration from El Salvador to the US as a nine year old um, without his parents. And really just a beautiful story and also um, harrowing for parents to read. If for seven weeks, his family didn't know where he was because for obvious reasons, they couldn't communicate with him. Beautiful book. I read Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang, which I, have you read that, Cindy? I haven't yet, but so many people have and recommend it. I need to. It, it is. It's fabulous. It's for for book, for writers and book people. It's it's catnip. It's um, tragic comedy of the bad art friend, or I think one reviewer called her calls the character the art monster, where the main character kind of lives the writer's dream, but for all the wrong reasons. It was I couldn't put it down. I really could not put that down. And then um, I'm rereading Inciting Joy by Ross Gay, which is a series of essays about joy. He, and he asked this question early in the book that what if joy is not separate from sorrow, but actually emerges as we help each other through hard things? And I just love that. It's just, it's just good medicine. Well, and that ties in well with your story, which deals with grief on some level. Yes, uh, yes, I, I think so. And I think the best books the best books help us process our, our big feelings. And there certainly is a theme of grief in Crow Talk. All three of my, my characters are, are coping with different losses. And I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Without spoiling anything again. <laughs> so, well, this has been wonderful, Eileen. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Cindy. It's been a pleasure. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. You know, a lot can happen in seven minutes, and luckily, that's how long it takes me to tell a story. My name is Aaron Calafato, and I'm the creator of 7-Minute Stories. I'm proud to partner with Evergreen Podcasts, and I'd like to invite you to join me on this journey. I'm going to take you on some crazy roller coaster rides using my unique extemporaneous storytelling style, and together, we're going to try to make sense of the world, all through the art of storytelling, and all in approximately seven minutes. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts From a Page. If you enjoy the show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts From a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. 
The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. You've got questions, we've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business when you need it from the people who have the answers. Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Joe. And And we're we're the the Professional Professional Book Book Nerds. Nerds. Two Mondays a month, we interview authors and talk about their upcoming books, what drives them, and their go-to order at the cafe. On Thursdays, we share recommendations and dive into topics readers face, like how do I actually read the books on my to-be-read list? You can find the Professional Book Nerds podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to learn more about us? Our website is professionalbooknerds.com, and you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at ProBookNerds. We hope you'll come and listen, and as always, happy happy reading. reading!